Pastor and writer Charles Swindoll once found himself with too many commitments in too few days. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, it does. He got nervous and tense about it. Quote, I was snapping at my wife and our children, choking down my food at mealtimes, feeling irritated at those unexpected interruptions through the day, he recalled in his book called Stress Fractures. Quote, before long, things around our home started reflecting the patter of my hurry-up style. It was becoming unbearable. I distinctly remember after supper one evening the words of our younger daughter, Colleen. She wanted to tell me something important that had happened to her at school that day. She began hurriedly, Daddy, I want to tell you something, and I'll tell you really fast. And suddenly, realizing her frustration, I answered, Honey, you can tell me, but you don't have to tell me really fast. Say it slowly. I'll never forget her answer. Then, Daddy, listen slowly. Ooh. From the mouths of a child. And children, parenting is one of the most wonderful, enlightening, difficult, exasperating, and I could have filled that slide with adjectives and words. Yes, I have parents around all here going, yep, yeah, you could have. Exasperating opportunities and challenges which the Lord gives to any person who's ever been blessed with a son or daughter. It's been said that by the time you finally have experience of being a parent, that's when the retirement checks start arriving. That's how I feel. Finally, that's how I feel about pastoral ministry. I think maybe I'm finally getting a clue how to do this. So let's, uh, let's work on this whole thing about parenting. I'm calling today's message the best parenting book. It's in the series Blind Spots. We're in a series in Proverbs called Blind Spots. Next week is the last message in this series. We've been going through this series. I was looking at my calendar. It's been since January, and it's, it's been exciting to me. I, I, hope, I hope it's been helpful to you. But uh, I, I, next week, we're talking about a truly noble woman, and it's from Proverbs 31. And so I, I hope you'll be here for that with us. But I'm aware that I'm talking to many people here who are facing parenting from many different life perspectives. Some have toddlers and elementary age children. Some of you do not. You've not had kids. Others have sons and daughters at the beginning of their careers. Some have offspring that are just in the first years of learning and how to end up starting their own families and raising their own sons and daughters. And still others of you are at the point in life where the words grandma and grandpa have become terms of endearment that you hear on a regular basis. And I can tell you, I did not fully embrace the term grandpa at first. And then God just kept saying, Dave, look in the mirror. You should embrace it. <laughs> That's not funny. Yeah, well, I'm the one who had a sense of humor, and I gave it to you. All right, thank you. You, you. you beat me again. Your move, Lord. So I know God's Word has truth to teach all of us here today, every single one of us. I've said that in the last few, few messages because they tend to focus on just like what we might consider, well, a, a part of the population of Christians. No, 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 no. This matches, I think, all of us today. And I want to make sure that God's words of guidance and wisdom are shared in a very practical, positive, edifying way. That's always my goal. That's always my prayer. So here's the goal. And you see it on the top of your notes. Again, those notes are at firstkville.org. You can download them if you wish. I hope you do. Understanding an important foundational biblical truth about parenting from Proverbs 22.6 will help us as we raise children, okay, so while I've already raised my kids, they fine, and then relate to them later in life, in their older years. So friends, while the Bible is filled with wonderful, inspiring words of wisdom for parents, warning, wisdom, instruction for parents, I want to focus on that one verse today in this very brief time, and compared to everything else we do in the rest of the week, this is a very brief time, so I want to really maximize it. 
that we have together. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, I'm going to read it, and you might say, well, that doesn't match my, my uh, translation of it. All right, so just hold on. Initiate a child in accordance with his or her ways. When he or she is old, he or she will never depart from it. Now, according to the pulpit commentary, that is a literal translation of that verse. Now, many of us have grown up in the church and have come to take that scripture in different versions and then sort of put our own spin on it or had, had pastors say, well, this is what this means. Well, I'm going to add my spin to it, and you can decide as you study the word where you want to land. So we have all these different versions and these varieties of ways, especially, and especially when it comes to advice for parenting. We need to look at this truth knowing that God offers help to us. He doesn't want us to do this alone. He has, special, he has such a special love for us in his heart and a love for his children. That's why every life is important. Every life is intentional. Every life matters. Amen? And you and I could spend a lifetime trying to learn or acquire and never possess the knowledge he has, but we could learn it. It's like in a gold mine. We could just keep digging out all of the riches in it and learn more and more, no matter how old we get, all the way till we meet the Lord. We take that final breath and we meet the Lord. So we can relax in the knowledge that God does want the best for our sons and our daughters. He really does, because he wants the best for us. But I want to gently point out, and this, I put this up on the screen, uh, there, are, there are different things that, I, that I'll say in my message, and then I go through it and highlight it and think, what do I want them to really see and hear? What is so crucial that if they forget, maybe they won't forget seeing it? This is one of them. One of them. I want to gently point out what I have encountered as a potential misunderstanding of this text. And... I realized that as I studied this text, this passage. Now, several scholars have taken, have different takes on the principle here, but there are some common themes running through it that I want to talk about today in the Best Parenting book. I want to do my best to strike a balance and cut away all the peripherals so we can get get to the heart of the truths in this very important principle of Scripture. But as I have said, I have seen people's lives... And you may think, this is so mundane. What are we doing? Well, okay, here's why we're doing this. I have seen people's lives really messed up because they took this verse out of context or somebody taught it to them improperly or they did their own spin on it and then they came back and blamed God for things that happened later. And for instance, I remember talking with one man in the very first church I was assigned to work at back in college, you know, assigned to work at. Yeah, we had Christian service assignments as Bible college students. And we part of our program was to go out into the community, and churches around Fort Wayne and the area would then say, we have room for a teacher in Sunday school, we have room for a music director, we have room for whatever. So that's how I got involved in a church in Fort Wayne. And this person I was talking to, and I understand, he was a godly man and gently spoken and a really nice guy and a very giving fellow. But he was adamant that this verse, Proverbs 22, 6, he was a leader in the church, by the way. He was one of the board members. He was adamant that this verse was a carte blanche promise that if from God that if a man and wife were to do his part in the equation, then that man and wife could hold God responsible for making sure that his, in this case, his daughters never walked away from a godly path in life. Do you see any problems with that? Just nod if you do. or Okay. But that's what he sincerely believed as a, a diehard Christ follower. Now, forget that his girls have the freedom, like all of us, to make choices in this life. 
No, God said it. That's what it means, Dave. So I'm taking him at his word. Oh, how that's nice. I'm taking him at his word. And God will do it. End of story. Well, one of his daughters married an abusive, drug-using young man. I found out later that the other daughter married equally problematically. And both of the parents, ironically, ended up at my associate pastor doorstep across town where I had been hired at Fellowship Missionary Church out on Tillman Road on the south side of Fort Wayne. And they told me their one daughter was making her own way in life and married this man they believed as an act of rebellion. And I think that's very true against mom and dad and their religion. Act of rebellion. I'm going to marry this person and you and God and nobody is going to stop it. Okay? And the sad part was that these dear parents, and again, I want to express, and I've said this repeatedly, I love them dearly. I, I have no clue what's going on in their lives. That was a long time ago. <laughs> but they had to deal with their disappointment. They really had to deal with their disappointment, not only with her and then their second daughter, but with God. I mean, it was like, <clears throat> to their faith. It's not working out like we thought it would and we've been taught. Why? Because their wrong belief led to wrong action. That is why it is so important that we study the Word of God. And like Paul said about the Bereans, they checked him. They checked him. They checked everything he said against the Old Testament. And you know what he you know what what Paul did about that? Oh, he got all defensive and said, "Don't do that. Just take my word for it." What, do any of you know what he called the Bereans for doing that? Anybody? Noble. He called them noble for doing that and not taking his word for it, but go check out God's word. So I'm asking you to check out God's word on all this. So their wrong belief led to wrong action and they didn't understand the intention behind Proverbs 22.6, and it's all about parenting. And I'm choosing just this verse because I believe it's so foundational. I hope it's corrective of any of our wrong thinking. I hope it's instructive so that we can correct a course if it's later on in life and we're still dealing with disappointment of choices that maybe our kids have taken or are taking or whatever the case might be. Like I said, this has something for all of us. So as I study this, here's what I discovered. Here's your outline. The intention in this biblical truth, the intention of this biblical truth focuses on our sons and daughters. The intent focuses on our sons and daughters. In other words, according to insight, insights which I discovered as I studied from several biblical commentators, this verse is pointing out three distinct parts of the life of any of our sons and daughters. And here they are. The truth, this truth focuses on their character. This truth focuses on our sons and daughters' character. Will our children know the difference between right and wrong? Will they be going off to college and suddenly being told that there is no God, that this is the way the United States and the government should be, and this is how you as Christians should be, if any of you are religious, and here's how you free thinkers who are not Christians should be rejoicing in that, etc., etc., etc. And you send your son or daughter off to school, and they come back after totally rejecting everything you led them and understood them, uh, helped them understand about God. This is how this happens. Will our children know the difference between right and wrong? Will they be willing to act in accordance with what is right, or will they choose the path of wrong? Will they have a basic understanding that the universe is operated with concrete spiritual realities at its heart, or will they easily accept a no-God premise and then start making up their rules as they go? 
this biblical truth is focusing on their character. Now you're going to say, well, how do we do that? We'll get to the second part, which focuses on us as parents. This first truth, this first part of it, focuses on the, the intention is the kids. So secondly, this truth focuses on their God-given design. It focuses on their God-given design. What's the meaning of this verse when it literally says, his way, as in, initiate a child in accordance with his ways, and when he or she is old, they will never depart from it. Very often, we have said, oh, that must be God's ways. That's not what this is saying, according to the studies that I did. According to my studies from the pulpit comment, now what, where are you getting this from? The pulpit commentary, the expositor's Bible commentary, and several others of note. This is pointing out that every one of us have been divinely designed with certain qualities, gifts, abilities, talents, inclinations. We've been designed this way with these abilities and these gifts to make a positive contribution to the, lives of the, uh, to the lives of the people around us and to make a positive difference in our own lives and our own success. So initiate a, in a, a child in accordance with his ways. According to Proverbs, there are two ways, the wisdom or the way of foolishness. And you and I probably walk in both of those worlds at any given time. The ways of wisdom, the ways of foolishness. As we teach our children the way of wisdom, it is our responsibility, according to God's maxim here, it is our responsibility to nurture a God-centered character that allows the, our kids the joy and the freedom to walk as Jesus' walk. friends, or their high school friends, or their college friends, or their graduate level friends, or their professional peers. It's our children's God-given design of talents and spiritual gifts and abilities that we are told to nurture and to develop. This means we steer them away from walking on the path of foolishness. And remember, they still have a free will. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. And like I said, how do I balance that free will and God's sovereignty? We have free will right up to the point where we don't. <laughs> okay? Where God says, uh, okay, no. Uh, I, no. I've been guiding this whole process, but that is a no. We're not doing that. Okay. So parents, it is so important that you and I understand what this Holy Spirit-directed author of Proverbs 22.6 is driving at. We need to realize that no child is a mistake. No child is an accident. They are all beautiful, intentional creations of a wonderful, loving Father in heaven. Amen? And we are being given the responsibility, the opportunity, the privilege to nurture them in the path God designed for them. We're to help them find out who God created them to be in this life. Initiate a child in accordance with his ways, the way of godly character, the way of their God-given design of gifts and talents, and third, this truth focuses on their capacity. Now, you may not believe this. It's all true, though. And if you, would not, if you would question this, all you have to do is go to the truth detector, my wife, and she will correct one way or the other. I am not going to give her any targets, so I'm telling you the truth. In my 20s and 30s, just a couple of years ago, I really enjoyed playing softball with the church softball league at the time. I actually enjoyed playing golf then, too. Notice I said enjoy playing golf. Now I just, when I go, rarely I just dig ditches. Those are called divots when you're in golfing. And even in my high school years, I played tennis. Poorly, but I played tennis. Now early on, as I was striving to get better and better, I realized a very tough lesson that is tough to take at first. That I really had to work doubly hard at playing sports way beyond somebody else who was naturally gifted athletically. I, 
when, when we had the A League, the B League, and the C League, I was on the C, and I did it proudly. But any time there were bases loaded and there was two outs and I had the opportunity to do, to drive in a run, kind of like the Pirates blew yesterday over and over and over, but they finally won. Thank you very much. Um, I could hear my boss at the time, and he had every right to do it. Who's up? Gruber. Ugh. And I generally rose to that expectation. <laughs> Fly out. I always had this terrible swing, and I would, I would golf the thing. So it would always go in the air, usually to the right fielder. They just, it, you could see, <laughs> when I would come up, the whole outfield would shift and pull in. Curses them. <laughs> I'm kidding. So look, folks, I had a certain capacity that could be exercised, but I'd never be able to play those sports like some of my peers that were naturally gifted by God with seemingly endless capabilities and capacities for athletics. Oh, I just thought of this. I went with her father once golfing. Now, the once should give you a clue because I was with my brother-in-law, Dennis, and uh, I was with Rich, and we went to a golf course and, you know, these guys could drive a thousand yards, you know, not really, but I mean, it was like it was a, the bionic man. There goes the ball. Me? Feet. <laughs> With dirt. So then Dennis, <laughs> where, Denny, if you happen to watch this out in Pittsburgh, I'm going to attribute this quote to you. Dave, face it, you're never going to get better. Now, this is a guy who missed being on the Pirates by one cut. All right, so he's athletically gifted. He still is. Darn him. <laughs> I'm kidding, Denny. I love you. So, look, I had to try doubly hard, and I couldn't compete with the guys who were seemingly endless capacities for athletics. And now, how does this tie in? It is vital for me as a father and as a grandfather to understand these truths because God has given my son, my daughter, my grandkids certain capacities within their areas of spiritual gifts and talents, natural talents. Within those areas, the sky is the limit. Outside of those areas, they can try real hard and maybe succeed well, but it won't be as easy with somebody who's been naturally or spiritually gifted at those things. We're talking about their capacity for greatness within whom and what God created them to be. Now, in our world today, we also need to understand, according to God's word, we are all born into this world with a sin nature, the natural desire to run from God instead of running to God. That's why a personal relationship with him is crucial. Otherwise, we can just do whatever we want to do. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. And now we're back to the Old Testament, which is why we have so many individuals <clears throat> identifying as this and identifying as that and saying, I was born to do this. I was born that way. Okay, maybe you were born that way, but we all need to be reborn in Christ. No matter how you feel you were born, fine. So this is why a personal relationship with him is crucial. He desires us to be in relationship with him so we can find our completion, our purpose, our path, and his perfect blueprint for us that he designed. Because all of that was fractured in the Garden of Eden. That's why Jesus had the plan to come and build a bridge back to him so we could find our original design, which is being in perfect relation, I mean, as he would see it, a perfect relationship with him while we are working out all of that. Work out your salvation daily here, we're told in God's word, until we see him. So he sets the perfect blueprint, and he, he wants to be in relationship with us because he loves us. He thinks you're, he thinks you're that special. And that is awesome, and don't forget that. Maybe some of you are feeling like you're just garbage. That is Satan or your own flesh lying to you. Maybe you're looking for your parents' approval. 
Maybe they have long since died. But you're still looking for your parents' approval. Don't dismiss the fact you could be doing that until you die. Give it up. Find your completion in Christ. He knows what he designed you to be. Apart from him and his personal redemption, we'll miss out on his best for our lives and resort to using the world's broken logic. I was born a woman, but today I feel like a man. Today I feel like a furry. Maybe I feel like an animal. I mean, come on. Yes, this biblical truth focuses on our son or daughter's redeemed capacity in God's divine blueprint. And we need to understand that. We need to grasp that and then act on it, especially when we are tempted to compare them with others or compare them with their siblings. Parents, you've done it. I've done it. We shouldn't do that. That will, that will really hurt a kid who becomes, who becomes an adult and carries it all along. If you've done that, you might want to go back and apologize to your kid. Say, you know what? I always compared you to so-and-so. I'm so sorry. I should have accepted you as you were. I'm, I'm sorry, please forgive me. That could change your relationship right now. They may never have heard you say that. Or an apology. And then say, are you serious? What do you want? I want you to know that God's working on my heart and I love you and I shouldn't have done that. I didn't read God's best parenting book. So please forgive me. Hmm. Okay. By the way, that's why we leave and cleave to our spouse. My parents didn't understand that. They were never taught that. The first few years of our marriage was a nightmare for this dear woman because my mom kept trying to intervene. Now, I never knew it. And she'd have to pull me aside and say, do you know what your mom just did? And it became, no. Then it became, now what? to where I had to make choices. And my youth pastor is the one, when I called him, I said, I don't know what to do. I got mom competing with my wife. And he said, you need to set the law, the law down right now with your mom, or she'll do that for the rest of your life. Yeah, but I might hurt her. You might hurt her. What about your wife? Oh, you're right. Thanks, Tracy. I appreciate that hard, godly wisdom. So please, parents, don't cave into the temptation to compare because their character, their God-given design, their capacity is what we're talking about. Initiate a child in accordance with his ways, her ways, and he or she will never depart from them. In other words, parents, to do this parenting thing the way God says we can do it, help them see who God has created them to be. Help that son or daughter, whether they're young or old, to see their uniqueness and the reason God put them here. Do all of that within the realm of good character, in other words, godly character, and they will always be able to rest in that identity and call you blessed for having done that for them. They may not do it now, but trust the Lord, they will come back to it. That, I believe, is the intent and the meaning of Proverbs 22, 6. Now, Let's clip through the rest of this. Let's not leave it there. Let's bring it even closer to home. Let's apply this to where it just stomps all over your, your toes and mine. Let's bring it closer to home. While the intention of Proverbs 22.6 focuses on our sons and daughters, the application of this biblical truth zeroes in on us. It zeroes in on us. The application... The intention focuses on the kids. The application of it focuses on us. The intention of this truth is focused on our children. As I said, the application zeroes right in on us, those of us who are parents, grandparents, etc. So here we go. We've looked at the three intentions. Here are three specific truths that we can take out of this for us as parents. One, we can influence and affect our offspring by our positive and godly or negative and selfish example. In other words, our character does count. Our character does count. How we react to life makes a difference in how our sons and daughters react to it. I will tell you this, not because I'm proud of it, because I think God would want me to say it, but I've had more apologies to make, about four of them, in the last two weeks because of the stress level that I have felt 
and I realize <clears throat> my tank's running low. And so Perry and the other elders have said, you will take a sabbatical. You need a sabbatical. I'm happy to tell you, I'm going in May, buddy. <laughs> Just uh, reserve some place this last two days. And I, you know what? I've never had any leaders in a church that I work for say, take a break. They usually wanted more. I did have one, the very first guy I worked for, Dave DeSome. He said, Grub, you need a break. Go. That's healthy. Thank you. Thank you to the leaders of this church. I really, really appreciate it. Mike really appreciates it too because we are able then as staff to say, take a break. You need a break. Don't burn out. So when I see my weaknesses or my faults coming through my son and daughter, <laughs> it's so tempting to go, wow, honey, they take after you. We know that's a lie. Because to say something like that means, ooh, that just hit us too close to home. I saw me there in Kristen. I saw me there in Joel. And now it's like my, my grandson, Ethan, what, like I told you, loves to play the pinball machine. It's like, oh, I love this kid. This is great. We can learn to play pinball. And then I have to realize, oh, wait a minute. I love all the other kids, too. I need to get into their world, not just because it reflects mine, but because it doesn't reflect mine, and I need to get down on the floor and play with the cars and everything else. So God's still teaching me all this stuff all the time, and I've, I've got so many miles to go. But when I see my weaknesses or faults coming through my son and daughter, it makes me look in the mirror of God's Word and then ask Him to clean me up. Your example, my example, will hold a lifetime of influence over our kids' lives. And please don't underestimate the potential influence of your example on the lives of your adult children. In this generation, there are many men and women who would give anything to hear their parents say a truly affirming word to them without qualification, without criticism. Like the mention by a parent of time in prayer spent for their adult son or daughter, knowing that Diane's mom, Ruth, prays for us. Ruth, thank you. That means everything to me. Thank you. It does have an impact. And, or maybe you could do the text message or a phone call that simply says, how you doing? Just thinking about you, praying for you today. And if you don't get a response, don't get defensive. You did your part. Okay? These are all messages and things I've had to say to myself, so I'm just repeating what the Lord has had to deal with me about. You know, if for, if for all those individuals who think this sermon has completely missed them because this doesn't apply to you, are you listening online or you're here, listen. The only time you're too old to do any of this as a parent is when people are respectfully lining up to see you before they close the lid. Okay? This applies to all of us. Parents, your character counts. Your character influences. Your character matters. I read this. To those of you with kids from 4 to 14, here is some advice called Minimum Daily Requirements by Charles White. Your Child's journey from ages 4 to 14 is very short, his, his or her journey. In today's world, the trip is not a safe one. Christian parents need to put God in each day's activities or their children will pay the consequences. The following ideas can make that easier. Teach your child to pray. Teach your child to pray. Bless your child each morning. Lord, may the, may the Lord bless you as you go. Oh, that sounds weird. Bless your child as they go. And they may have a heart attack when you come up and put your hand on them and say, I just want to pray for you. Lord, I pray you'd give daughter, son, your insight and your blessings today. I pray you would bless them, and I bless them in Jesus' name. And then they, then they might say, what is wrong with you, Dad? What is wrong with you, Mom? Nothing. Things are right. God's working on my heart. This will all play against our pride, too, I'm telling you. Are you too proud to do this? well, then you may have a really proud kid who won't listen 
because they feel dumb. Wow, who are they imitating now? Oh, it's my spouse. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Bless your child. May the Lord strengthen you with power through, your, through his spirit. Take short walks with your children. You know, I looked through our security camera the other day, just trying to see because our trustees put on this whole new light system outside that automatically changes with sun up and sun down, and you don't have to go in there and fiddle with it all manually. And I was looking, and I was looking through the... I, was, I saw these images of me walking through the camera, and do you know what I was doing every single time? And I thought, holy cats. I think that borders on an addiction. I need to work on that. But I saw myself do that. That ain't good. How about you? What if you had a security camera following you around? What would you see? Take short walks with your kids. Get them away from the phone. Get outside to God's world as much as possible. Display your child's Sunday school lesson on the refrigerator. Take care of each lesson. A lot of people, this author says, Charles White says, a lot of people have gone out of their way to, to get it to your kid. So whenever I see a lost Sunday school lesson from children's, from the children's ministry here, I, I, I put them aside in the office and think, well, maybe somebody will want to pick this up. I don't want to just throw it away. And as he says, none of these efforts is a guarantee that our daughters and sons will know God in time to face all the pressures of being a teen in this dangerous world. However, they are the least we can do, the very least. Just like we have a minimum daily requirement for our nutritional needs, let's remember our children have a minimum daily requirement for spiritual food. Secondly, a specific truth for parents we can gain from applying God's insights in Proverbs 22.6. We can guide them into wonderful discoveries of their gifts, or we can exasperate them by making them copies of us. In other words, our desires will determine. Parents, it's vital to make certain that your desires for your kids match up with God's desires for your kids. Otherwise, you will exasperate them. And we are told to build them up. Don't make them copies of you. Guide them into discoveries about who they are and what God created them to be as they walk with him. Moms, dads, you'll never be sorry you did. Finally, this third one. We can expect the best from them and their God-given capacity or fill them with misbeliefs about their limitations. In other words, our expectations can encourage uh, there was this beautiful lady at Bible College, beautiful lady, voice that would just knock it out of the park. And honestly, it took me a while to realize that at birth, one of her arms had not fully formed because I, did, I, I never really noticed it because she could hold a microphone and everything. And I, I, I knew her well enough as a friend. I could say, how did you get to the point where this doesn't bother you? I mean, I don't mean to be offensive. It's like, no, Dave, we can talk about any of this if you want. That, I'm fine with that. You're a friend. Okay. How did you get to have such a good attitude? All my mom and dad. It's all about my mom and dad. They told me that just because God allowed this, not to think of it as a curse but as a blessing, and that I could do anything I wanted to do if I believed in that because they believed in me. <sighs> To this day, she's a friend on Facebook. I'll never forget it. What an example. Remember, our expectations can discourage, make certain they encourage. That is God's way of parenting from the best parenting book. David Jeremiah wrote this as I wrap it up. Parental love is unconditional, and so is God's love. No matter what a child of God has done against him or feels he or she has done that cannot be forgiven, God still loves that wandering soul. He will never quit loving his own. He will keep pursuing them until they finally give up and he has them back. He's just that kind of God. There are lots of books out there. 
about raising kids, but in my opinion, this is the best parenting book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to study just one verse and all of the all of the diamonds in it. Lord, I pray that I have not in any way misrepresented your word. If I have, please forgive me. I know there's a stricter judgment for teachers. And I don't want to fall under that. So I have tried to divide rightly your words today. And I pray you, you, you say in your word that your word will not come back void. So I pray for any of those online. I pray for any of us here that have needed to hear this, which I think is all of us, starting with me. And I pray you'll help us act on that, even as I, we have expectations of, our, of ourselves and how we give away those expectations or communicate them to our spouse or our friends. Lord, help us take a deep dive into the look in the mirror so that we can see us. We don't have security cams on us all the time, but we need to see us as you see us. Help us be aware of our weaknesses. Help us correct them in your power and help us encourage and not discourage. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Be safe. Have a great week. See ya. Bye.